Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Once again, Merry Christmas to each and every one of you on this first Sunday after Christmas, and we continue to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Parents spend a lot of time with their children over the holiday seasons, as they're oftentimes out of school, a little different this year where they've maybe been spending time with their kids a lot more with staying at home and whatnot. But the holidays is oftentimes a time where moms and dads spend extra time with their kids as they are excited about opening presents, as they're excited about seeing grandmas and grandpas, as they're excited of seeing cousins running around. And if we're honest with ourselves, that can lead to some frazzled nerves and uh, some, some anxiety or some frustration in households. Sometimes moms and dads and kids need a little time apart to realize how much they truly love one another. That always can help. But this is that season, right, where families are traditionally together. It is that time of year. And when we look at our children, when we look at our children, we pray that we see blessings from God. Today in our gospel reading, we hear of Mary and Joseph as they take their new child, who was a little over a month old, to the temple to offer a proper sacrifice to offer a sacrifice that was required in the law. And there was a man you heard or read about in our gospel reading named Simeon. And this man had been waiting for some time. He had been promised by God himself that he would not die until he saw the Christ. This man had a promise. And he trusted that God would fulfill that promise. And as he saw this child, he spoke these words. He spoke these words in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Now those are no small words for a mother who is holding her child to hear spoken about that small baby. Imagine those words being spoken to you. Could you imagine someone saying something about the child that you were holding that is, sounds so magnificent, so marvelous? But these were not even the first words that were spoken about this child that were pointing to something so much bigger, so much grander. If we simply go back one chapter in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 28. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and trying to discern what kind of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Some amazing words spoken to the parent, to to the mother of Jesus right there. Simeon also speaking amazing words to the mother of Jesus. And his earthly father had, not been, uh, had, had been privy to some amazing words himself, which are recorded in Matthew chapter 1. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Mary and Joseph had a lot to marvel about with this child that had been given to them. And that is what they did. Luke 2, 33, And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. Over and over and over, they are told how marvelous this child is and is going to be. This child was indeed amazing. This child was indeed perfect. As a mother lays in the hospital after giving birth to her newborn child, she will oftentimes hold that child in her arms and utter something to the extent of, this child is perfect. As a father wrestles with his three-year-old child in the living room on the floor, he may have thoughts of, this child is truly amazing and perfect. When a grandparent sees their grandchild playing Little League Baseball or playing the piano or singing a song, they will look and think, wow, what an amazing child. I can still remember the day when it was quite apparent to me as a young boy that my grandfathers thought I was pretty special. The Little League Baseball Tournament, and I was up to bat, and the other team decided it was time to intentionally walk their grandson, and they were not too pleased, for they had come to watch their grandson play baseball and not be walked down to first base. They gave a holler or two, probably needed to confess a sin or two afterwards, but they came to see their amazing grandson. Is that not the attitude of so many parents, so many grandparents, when they look at those precious children that they have been blessed with from God? Parents and grandparents will oftentimes think that their children and their grandchildren are the greatest things since sliced bread. Why do parents think that their kid is the best. Now, that might be a little bit of an overstatement or an exaggeration, but we can see that in society, can't we? And I think, for the most part, it's okay. I hope most parents see positive things in their children and are their biggest fans and encouragers. Yet, we also see it go over the top a bit, do we not? If you spent any time with parents at sporting events or parents in classrooms or parents in anywhere, you know that they get a little bit exuberant about their children at times and maybe not in a healthy manner. They think their kid is going to be the next Michael Jordan or the next Bach or the next Van Gogh or the next whatever you fill in the blank and they see the positive or maybe they are blinding themselves to seeing the negative. Whatever it might be, parents are usually exuberant about the successes of their children. Everybody wants their children to be good at whatever they do. Everyone wants their children to be successful, yet the longer we are with our children, the more that we recognize that they are like their parents, flawed human beings. The mother who holds her child in the hospital, thinking how perfect her baby is, wonders what could have gone wrong when the report card comes home from school or the call from the principal rings on the phone. The dad who wrestled with his kid on the floor, thinking how wonderful that child was, may have a different feeling when they come home with Officer Smith on a Friday night. What could have gone wrong? I love them. What could have gone wrong? I did so much for this child. We want to hold our children and marvel, yet when we are honest, we see reality. 
They are sinners just like their parents. Yet the hope and joy of the Christmas season is that there was a child that was held in the arms of his mother, and she simply marveled at the one whom she held. She held him, and people continued to say amazing things about this child, and she could not help but agree. She continued to be close to this son who was said to do such great things. Yet as more and more people began to know about him, the tone of the accolades began to change. Yes, many still praised him for his ability to heal, for his ability to cast out demons, for his ability to do great signs and wonders, but the tone of the words that were spoken about him began to change. Many said he was crazy. Yet others said he was possessed by the devil himself. Others said he was a blasphemer and he needed to be punished. And I don't know what Mary thought when she heard these words spoken about her son. Yet she has been told by many people, by angels themselves, what great things this child would do. She knew her son had a very special purpose, yet it would seem that the finer details maybe were yet still unclear. She knew that he would save his people from their sin, yet how? How would he do this? How would he do this as she held him in her arms after he was taken down from a cross? How in the world was he going to save his people from his sins as he lied dead in her arms? What was going through the, uh, or the mind of Mary at this time, one can only imagine. No doubt consumed with grief. No doubt consumed with sadness, but perhaps even consumed with a bit of disappointment. How could this child be dead? He was supposed to do such great things. How could my son be gone? He wa- wasn't he supposed to save us all? She held her child and no doubt was filled with these feelings. Yet whatever she felt, whatever she felt, it was not due to the lack of that child. It was not due, beca- due to the fact that this child did not live up to his calling Rather, it was because of each and every one of us and Mary herself that he went to the cross and died. Every parent has been disappointed at some point in their children, and that marvel that once was there perhaps had lost its luster. Yet Mary had every reason to marvel, as we do, when we look to the child that was born on Christmas, who would bring the marvel back, who would bring the wonder back, who would bring forgiveness to those who so desperately need it. As I look at my child and children, I can now marvel at them, not because they are perfect, not because they are so wonderful and amazing, but I can marvel because somebody loves them more than me. Somebody loves them so much that he would lay his life down for them and bring the marvel back and bring forgiveness to them. I can marvel that in the waters of holy baptism they have been given faith in Christ, and washed by his blood. I can marvel that when I look in the mirror, I can see the same thing for me. And I can marvel as I stand in the pulpit and I look out, and the marvel has been placed back on each and every one of you, not because you are so wonderful and amazing, but because of what this child did for you and for me. 
It is only Mary and Joseph who understood what it was like to have a perfect child. And that perfect child had not come simply for them, but for the whole world. Because there had not been a perfect child before, but only imperfect sinners born one after another. So brothers and sisters in Christ, those who have been redeemed by this blood, by this child, let us rejoice like Simeon, knowing that our salvation has come into the arms of his mother, to be raised by his mother, to walk to the cross, and to spread out his own perfect arms and give his own perfect life for the sins of the world, that the children of God can now be in the loving arms of their Father. Let us give thanks and praise this day, for we are the children of God who have been brought into faith through Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his name, amen.